To a London <coughs> resident, what does a basement bring to the property? To a London resident, it all depends on what area the property is. Because if it is in West London, some parts of South London, some parts of North London and Central London, pound per square foot is going to uh, be quite high. So if you're going to create a thousand square foot basement under your property in Fulham, that is going to add one million pounds to your resale value of your house. Now, it's not only about creating the extra value for your property, it's also about creating the extra space for your family. So, i.e. you can have more bedrooms, utility rooms, chill out zones, whatever you want down there. You know, we've even done a plan for a basement in Belgravia a couple of years ago for a two and a half thousand square foot basement under the lower ground floor, which we've got planning. And the lady wanted it only for her kids to be able to kick around a football on some AstroTurf. And that basement would have cost a million quid to build, but as it was, you know, adding pound per square foot in Belgravia, it would have added four million quid to the resale value. So yeah, it all depends what area you are living in in London, because obviously the construction costs are quite high. So a thousand square foot basement is going to cost you shell and core and fit out 400 grand, but it's going to add 1 million to the resale value. So yeah, all depends on where the basement is going, in what location. Why use a design and build company like New Projects to complete a basement <clears> project? <throat> People usually go for a design and build construction company to keep things all under one roof because if you go to an architect, the architect does their uh, planning drawings, then once it gets planning, it goes to a third party contractor. They have the planning drawings. They then got to wait until the scope of works and working drawings are done by the architect. And it's a long drawn out sort of process. You know, there's, there's changes. And obviously it's not only the architects, it's the structural engineers, it's the quantity surveyors, all the professionals, which all, you know, all, all third parties. So when you're a design and build company, like new projects, we have it all under one roof. So if we want to make changes to some plans, it's literally a phone call and Susanna is our uh, lead architect. She makes the changes, she liaises with the client, which the client liaises with me and all the project coordinators, and then we can implement it very quickly. Where if it was a third party architect, we've got to wait because we aren't priority, are we? You know, they may have 10 jobs on the go, uh, which is gonna delay things and we want instant responses. So going with a designer build company is always the best solution for the client. So that's why new projects is very, very busy. How is the final price determined on a project? <clears throat> the final price of a project is determined by the time it takes to do the project. If it goes over the agreed scope of works, because when we start a project, it's all documented in the contract and it relates to a set of plans and it all goes back to a set of drawings and the scope of work so and, and it's signed off so throughout the build if the client wants to move a door from A to B that's a variation so that takes time to move from A to B if the client um, wants to increase the budget for a kitchen from 30 grand to 100 grand that, that reflects on the, 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 the difference in the pricing. So yeah, there's lots of variables can change along the way. But if no one changes the scope, everything remains the same. If we're doing a basement, we're digging down and we hit something really hard. A big slab of concrete, which is gonna take a month to demolish. London, during the Blitz, there's loads of building sites. 
you know, bomb sites, I mean. So some of these houses, especially if they're built in the 50s and 60s, they could be built on X bomb sites. So that can affect time scales and costs. Have you got any tips for anyone attempting to get planning permission? Always go with a architect who is registered. Don't try and do it yourself. You can do drawings yourself and submit, but there's a good chance it's going to be rejected. And um, don't put in an application which you know is going to get rejected. So every council around the country has got their own planning policies and it tells you how much space you can create for like a real extension, loft conversion, basement, new build, whatever it may be. Um, there's lots of things you can do under permitted development. That's, that means you can get planning approval because it, it, you know, if you want a standard loft conversion, the council won't ever say no because it's permitted development. Just go with the right architect and don't be over ambitious on what you're trying to achieve. In your expertise, what order would you recommend renovating a house? Well, it all depends on what extent you are going to be renovating your house. So if it's a full refurbishment, house, three bedrooms, couple of receptions, en suites, whatever. So yeah, what we would tend to do on a full refurb, we strip the whole place out. So every single thing comes out. The old electrics, the old plumbing, the old kitchen, the floorings, back to brick. And then we go again, new electrics, new plumbing, plastering, flooring, kitchen, decoration, and just fitting out. You strip it all out first, and then you slowly rebuild your dream property. What would you suggest to anyone looking to move into London? Rent first, because you want to find out what area is good for you. And London, it's not that big. You need to know your areas because, you know, one part is Uber Prime, 100 yards down the road, different. It's very, very tricky. You know, I don't live in London. I've never really fancied living in London, uh, but my business is in London, and um, you know, it is, it is a different world up here. If you're coming into London, then you'll be, you're gonna be taken on by Citibank, and you're earning 250,000 pounds a year plus bonuses, go and live in Canary Wharf. That's where you're gonna be. If you are into sort of fashion and design and all that kind of stuff, Shoreditch, you know, that's where all the young, trendy, you know, designers are. Where we are here is Fulham. This is very family orientated and, um, you know, you've got lots of parks right on the Thames, affordable, you know, maybe renting a two bedroom flat a month in Fulham, two grand a month maybe. If you want to rent a house, three and a half, four thousand pound a month, this is just for a terrace house or a small flat. It's up to you. I would rather rent, rent or buy a house a little bit further out of town where you've got something for your money. In your expert opinion, is a loft conversion an investment worth making? So a loft conversion is definitely worth doing if you haven't already uh, done it. So basically a loft conversion in a normal terrace house is a circa 300 square feet to maybe 400 square feet. So again, in Fulham, if you, if you even own a first floor flat and you can get access to the loft, so that will get you in the loft another bedroom and an on the suite. So for the cost of a, of a loft conversion, which will be 55 to 60K, you're gonna create your extra bedroom and ensuite, plus you're gonna get 300 square feet extra to the size of your property. So in Fulham, 300 square feet times a thousand pound a square foot, that's, just, that's 300,000 quid just by doing your loft conversion. So it's gonna cost you 60, but you're gonna, you're gonna gain uh, 300K. So yes, loft conversions are well worth doing. What would you say screams modern in a home in London? Can you give any examples? I like traditional with a twist of modern architecture. A terraced house, for instance, like you would do anywhere in the country. 
and then when you go through into the, the living room and the kitchen, it's all open planned. And then you, when you go into the back where the extensions is, you can have like a, a massive glass extension. You know, maybe even a two story glass extension with a mezzanine floor, like to double the height inside. Traditional with modern twist of architecture. Is there anything else you'd like to? Talk about? No. I just had a phone call earlier uh, and it was from a chap who's just bought 35 Chesilton Road. So you know that, that our first basement we did with the orange door? Yeah. Right? That was our first basement project we did. So when we did that five years ago, that property was sold for 3.5 million quid, which was three and a half thousand square feet and it was sold for three and a half uh, a mil, thousand pound a square foot. It's just changed hands again. The past owner was just going through a divorce and uh, they wanted to sell it quick. So this guy I've just met, he's got his funds together and um, they have just purchased it for three million quid. So I've just had a little walk around and it looks really, really good. It's really stand, stand, stood up to the test of time. And um, yeah, it was quite good to walk back in there and to have a look um, at you know what how our projects have lasted over five years. It's still got the horrible orange door, but he wants us to go back in there because in the, in the rear light well, he wants to convert that into a really cool, glass wine cellar and also he wants the garden remodeled and refurbed to make it look really cool so yeah that's just a, a good little phone call we had because they're really happy with the work and it's lasted really well no shrinkage no cracks no marks everything works so that's a good test of time yeah so that's 35 chesilton road very pleased peace done